Okay, hey, welcome back uh, our, from our 20-minute uh, uh, break here. We got a chance to uh, kind of switch out the gear and uh, get some new stuff in here so we can do this uh, chapter. So uh, let's pick up where we uh, left off. And uh, where we left off was me trying to communicate this to you. And I'll, I'll say it again, that everything we've done in the first seven chapters, we're going to try to do again in this chapter, but apply it to rotations. And the best advice I can give you here in this chapter is uh, if you see the parallelism between rotational motion and translational motion, it makes this chapter much more doable. It's like, okay, that's obvious, that's obvious, because I already learned that for translational motion, now I just apply it to rotational motion. And I was leaving off here pointing out that when it comes to rotation motion, we're going to go ahead and use the Greek alphabet. And I should have put here and, and spelled it out, the word omega, because I wanted to emphasize that, again, this is not a W. This is an omega. Uh, in fact, when I make a W, maybe I'll just make one over here. I'll try to do this. I'll try to make straight lines uh, with no curly things on the end. All right, and so <clears throat> that will hopefully distinguish between the uh, Latin alphabet, the W, and the Greek alphabet, the omega. And as long as I'm doing that, I should probably come back up here and say, okay, now this is theta. Um, I don't know if I actually said theta. I just said that uh, you've seen that in your math class, the Greek letter theta, and... Uh, uh, like I said, I, I can't recall if I said theta or not, but I got to think about it on the break that maybe I should uh, spell that out just in case you're not familiar with the, the, the Greek alphabet. But you'll be somewhat familiar by the time you go through a science class because we like to use uh, the Greek uh, alphabet for a lot of different reasons. But when it comes to mechanics, we like to use the Greek stuff for rotation and then the Latin alphabet for the uh, translation. So keep that in mind. Um, let's keep going with our discussion. I would say right now, we had a quick discussion here about chapter uh, two and tried to get you understanding what we call rotational or angular speed because the other thing we talked about in chapter two was accelerations. And we used the A and said that it was defined as the change in translational speed divided by the time taken. And the units were meters per second squared, or we could have even used some other units like kilometers or hours. Uh, we didn't do too much of that. We mostly just stuck to meters per second squared. But I want to use that as a comparison to rotation. So let me come back to a rotating object. And uh, this, again, this wheel just kind of makes a good first one here, uh, where I was saying if you focus your attention on this, this blue one going around, you'll kind of see it go around here and you'll say, okay, there is its rotational, uh, it, it, its rotational uh, speed. But if I were to maybe put my hand on it so that I slowly bring it to a stop, I would say this object is changing its rotational speed or getting it started. Getting it started, I may give it a little nudge and then a little more and 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 it keeps going faster and faster and faster. And of course, when I say faster and faster, I don't mean translational speed. I mean rotational speed. And so because the rotational speed is changing, we would have an acceleration that we would define here as, again, the change in, uh, and I'll just do angular speed divided by the time taken for that change. And so, again, we would use the word rate. Because any time we divide by time, we call it a rate. Something changed with time. Now, in this case, the 
angular speed is changing. Whereas before the break, we were talking about the angular position changing. That is its, its angle. But if I write this out in, in, in symbols here, I might call this the change in, and angular speed would be the omega and the time taken. And so I'm hoping you can see that Hey, what we learned in chapter two, everything we learned about translational acceleration, we could then apply now to our particular problem involving rotations because we would have a rotational acceleration. And so that's the part that I want to add here. This would be a rotational acceleration or often sometimes an angular acceleration acceleration. And so hopefully not a surprise now you're getting to see the pattern that the definition of angular or rotational acceleration is the rate at which its angular speed is is changing. And again hopefully not a surprise we would use a symbol from the Greek alphabet. A symbol that would match the first letter of the Latin alphabet which happens to be alpha. And so an alpha looks like this. And so in my little chart here, I will put here then angular acceleration. So here is alpha. Alpha equals the change in the angular speed divided by time taken. And maybe again, I should spell out the word alpha. And so theta, omega, alpha, all from the Greek alphabet. But again, the concept is the same. Just one, we're talking about rotation, and we've already talked about translation. And we could do the same thing with the units. Um, we could then get degrees per second each second. Uh, we could also get, and this is what your author of this book does a lot, so I'll put this one. He says revolutions per minute as they change every second. And that's kind of a mixed unit, kind of a weird unit, uh, I think, but uh, it's a very useful one. Uh, for example, uh, before the break, I was talking about the hard drive on your computer. And I know for my computer, if I listen, huh? Square. No, no, no. No square. So it's revolutions per minute each second. Is that what you mean? So there's no square. There's the minute right there. Okay. Uh, uh, so uh, let's take, for example, my, uh, my hard drive, as I was starting to say. So my, my, my hard drive on my computer is about uh, 7,500 RPMs. And I've just kind of learned over time that it takes about roughly three quarters of a, of a second, just, just, just under a second to, to get up to, to speed. Uh, usually I notice that most when my computer goes to, to sleep. Uh, like right now, after we video this, I might go over to my office and, and uh, check some emails, see if you guys have uh, sent me anything. And I'll move the mouse, and if I listen to my computer, I'll hear this. And, 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 and that, that increasing of the pitch is the increasing of the, of the speed of the, of the hard drive. And just over time, I've learned it, it's about three quarters of a, of a second. And so if I was curious to say, what is the angular acceleration? And so I'd say, okay, what is the angular acceleration of my hard drive? I would then, in the numerator, say, well, what is the change in the angular speed? Okay, so it would be uh, 7,500 RPMs once it gets up to, to speed. And it would have started at zero. And maybe I'll just put RPMs there also, RPMs. And so the change is 7,500 RPMs. It went from, you know, sleeping. That's what they mean by sleep. It just, hey, don't, don't spin it. Save a little electricity. But uh, 
the hard drive only works while it's spinning, so we got to bring it up to speed before we can start using our, our computer. Um, and then it takes about three quarters of a second. So if I grab my calculator here, I will have 7,500, then divided by three quarters of a second. And that comes out to be 10,000. So it's 10,000 RPMs every second. And so that's the angular acceleration of my hard drive if I were to use mixed units. And like I said, that, that's probably pretty good for us, but I will take this one more step. If I wanted to know what it was, say, in degrees per second squared, this would be a nice example of converting units. And so, okay, here's my 10,000. The R stands for revolutions, okay. The per is division, and then we have a minute. And then we have seconds. And so this is often what we mean by mixed units, that we really could put minutes and seconds together as either a second squared or the other way around, a minute squared, although second squared seems more appropriate. But leaving it this way could be very useful because this is just telling me my rate in RPM. It changes by 10,000 RPMs every second. But if I do a pretty hard step here, so I hope this makes sense to you, I could do my unit conversion. And so if you remember over here, uh, we said one revolution is 360 degrees. Okay, so this would be 360 degrees. And I didn't put it on the board, but I think you already know that a minute is 60 seconds. So I could replace the one minute with 60 seconds. And so if I get out my calculator and go 10,000 times 360, then divide that by the 60, I get 60,000 degrees per second squared. And so these would be saying the same thing. Oh, maybe I should have circled that one. But... I think this one might be more appropriate if we're talking about speed in uh, rotations per minute, which is, or revolutions per minute, is uh, the uh, kind of the appropriateness for this problem since we're measuring speed in RPMs, not in degrees per, per second. But I did want you to see a hard unit conversion to point out here that I would say at this point, in the uh, lecture here of chapter 8, I have done the equivalent of chapters 1 and 2. That is converting units and also measuring position, velocity, and acceleration. And my hint for you, since we won't have enough time for me to do too many more calculations, is when you get to doing a problem, Go back and think about what we did in chapter 2. For example, in chapter 2, we said something like, if I had something that started at rest, and then a little bit later was going at this faster speed, and it took a certain time to do that, and it said, what is the acceleration? I would have used then the formula for acceleration. I would have said, change in velocity per time. And that's exactly what I just did with this hard drive, right? I said, what's the angular acceleration? I gave you the final speed, I gave you the initial speed, I got the time taken. And so sometimes I find it very useful to tell students is if you, if you find yourself having any kind of troubles in this chapter, pause for a moment and change the problem to a translational problem. And I think you might be able to understand what's going on if you change it to a translational problem. And then in the process of doing that, you could then convert it back to the real problem with rotation and say, oh, okay, so this is how I would have done it if it was a translation. So now I'm going to do this problem, which is a, a, a rotation.
So that's kind of my, my hint towards you. And so let me not spend too much time doing any more examples. I wish we did, but I'll just wait for your questions then um, if you have any troubles with this and, and uh, maybe even come back tomorrow and uh, if I get a, 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 some hard ones and maybe I'll go over some hard ones. But I better continue on here with this uh, material because if you remember, and I'll just kind of maybe put a line here, after we did chapter two, we went to chapter three. And in chapter three, it was Newton's three laws of motion. Now, at the time, we didn't say it was Newton's three laws of translational motion, but we probably should say that now. Because when it comes to rotation, we really only focus on the first two, but they have the same thing. Now, remember, what was Newton's first law? Newton's first law says, and I, I put all the cart away, maybe that was good. But if you remember me rolling a cart and letting it go, it said if there was no forces or if there was balance forces on the cart, it would just keep moving along. And so we called this the law of inertia. It was Newton's first law. There is also a Newton's first law of rotation. Oh, watch this. If I come over here and I get something moving. Now in this case when I say moving I mean rotating. Alright so here's this wheel rotating again. And so once it's rotating it's going to keep rotating unless and so here's where I can come and put my hand on it. That can stop it. And in this case it doesn't rotate unless I put my hand on it and spin it. And so this too is the first law. It is the law of inertia. Now we will call this the first law of rotational motion, but an object that is already spinning wants to keep spinning. And an object at rest wants to remain at rest. Unless there's an unbalanced, and don't say force, because as we're going to see, we want to distinguish between translation and rotation. And so to get something to speed up or to slow down, we apply a torque is going to be our word. And so that might be a new word for, for some of you. But it is called a torque for really two reasons. The first one is just the semantics of it. We want to make sure we are discussing the physics and the kinematics of rotation. Don't confuse that with the, the uh, translation kinematics. So to get something to move in a translation, I apply a force. To get something to start spinning or to stop spinning, I apply a torque. And so we like to say this, an object spinning would continue to spin unless it has an unbalanced torque. And so now we need to talk more about torque because as you'll see, torque is not just a different word because we're dealing with rotations and translation. But it is that. That's really nice because I would never use the word torque for translational motion. I would only use torque for rotational motion. And likewise, I will use force to imply something translates. Although force, as you will soon see, is a necessary component, part of, not the whole thing, but part of torque. And so that's why maybe the most important thing I can point out here in Newton's three laws is this idea of torque. By the way, did you, did you see how I spelled the first letter of it? It's the Greek letter tau. I didn't put torque, although that's fine because I'm not really doing symbols with a T, 
But we're going to use the Greek letter tau tau in order to describe this thing called torque. And so maybe the best thing I can do in this chart over here as we get started with chapter 3 is to say with translational motion we learned this concept of a force. You applied a force, a net force would make it accelerate. You would make it go faster, it would make it go slower, it would make it turn. So to make a rotating object have a rotational acceleration, we would apply a torque. And so as I was saying, torque is an important word for two reasons. One is just semantics. One is, I will use the word torque for rotations and I will use the word force for translations. That's a big thing right there. But it is even much more than that, as you will soon see here. And so to get something to rotate, you need a torque. Not a force, a torque. And maybe at this point you're going, well, isn't a Torque really just a push or a pull? Isn't it just a force? And I'm going to say no to that. Not quite. And I think you'll see that best with this door over here. When somebody walks through a door, and in this case it's, it's locked so I've got to push the, the handle in, but to open the door I would say the door pivots, the pivot, the, the door rotates. So to open a door, it's not about a force, it's more about a torque. Uh, okay, but again, aren't you just using your hand to apply a force? Well, I will say in part that is true. But have you ever walked up to a door and accidentally thought it opened the other way. Now on this door I don't think you could because you can see the handle and you can see the handle is more towards this uh, part of the door which would be the right of the door away from the hinges and the hinges are over here on my left. And so you end up applying the force far from the, the hinges. But if I just hold this in so that it's in the open position and I try to open the door by pushing here I can open it it's true <laughs> but it's not easy so I have to put a lot more force to open the door near the hinge than when I'm here and so what I'm trying to point out here is to get this door to open, it's not just how much force I put on the door. It's also where is that force. Because if I apply the force right here, I can open the door really easy or with a small force. But notice I have a big distance from the hinge. If I try to open the door here, I can do it, but I've got to push really hard. And this is kind of my silly way of trying to get you to see that when you go to open a door, or for that matter, when you go to rotate any object, you need not just a force, but just as important is the location of that force in relationship to the pivot point, in this case the hinges. In, in other words, if I were to draw a picture, and maybe you've experienced this by working on some uh, device, <laughs> 
that has a bolt. Uh, maybe it's an automobile engine. Uh, maybe it's a flat tire and you got to take off the lug nuts on the, on the tire. But when you go to remove or to tighten a bolt, that is a rotation. And so if the bolt looks maybe like this, so make a little hex bolt, and you put a wrench on it that looks like this, and you go to loosen the bolt, okay, and so maybe I'll grab the wrench and pull. If I grab the wrench here and pull with a force of, say, 100 newtons, or I grab it here and pull with a force of 100 newtons, I'm trying to get you to see you don't get the same result. You see that best with a door. I push with a hundred here and it opens. I push with a hundred here and it doesn't open. And so this is my silly way of saying torque is actually something more than just force. Sure, force is part of it, but what we like to say is the distance away, which we'll label as an R, we'll call it the lever arm, is just as important as the amount of force itself. And so a torque is not the same as a force. In fact, a torque is a combination of both the force and, let me call it, the lever arm, the distance away. Those two factors come into play. And so that's why I've been saying, and I'm going to take some extra time here because I think there are really two challenging things in this chapter. One is torque, another one's coming up called the rotational inertia or the moment of inertia. Your author calls it rotational inertia. But this right here, I'm trying to convince you, is not just a different semantics in it, but it is a different idea in fact, torque is more complicated. Again, that's why I think rotation is more complicated. Because a torque, and so let me use the symbol tau, is made up of a lever arm, let me call that R, and a force F. And so that's what I was trying to illustrate by either opening this door or letting you think about when you opened a door or for those of you who've had some work with wrenches and bolts to get to you to realize that the further out you hold this wrench the more torque you have and that is the better you are uh, better uh, the, the I don't want to say stronger, but I want to say you're going to get more torque. This here gives you more torque than here. Same force but different amounts of torque. Uh, maybe another ex two examples will, will help here. Um, maybe you've ridden a bicycle before. And if you've ever ridden a, ridden a bike that has multiple gears, and you get to a hill, To make it a little easier to get up the hill, you'll change gears. And on the back tire, there'll be this multiple gear sprocket. And if you adjust the gears so the chain goes around a big one, as opposed to the chain going around a small one, the bigger one will give you more torque. Because I'll say it again, the torque 
is not just how much force. Yes, that's part of it. So you can't get up the hill unless you pedal the bike. You gotta have a force. Okay, so so the force is coming from that chain which is connected to your foot. So your foot does have to put a force. So I'm not trying to say that force isn't important. But what I am trying to say is just as important as the force is the distance away. And so putting your bike in a gear which on your gear selector on your handlebars it'll it'll say a smaller number so if we go from say fifth gear down to third gear uh, the number on the little dial there is smaller but the actual sprocket in the back of the bike is actually bigger and so as I downshift from fifth gear down to third gear as I start to go up the hill I'm going to be able to get more torque just because the lever arm is bigger and that's the little subtlety about torque I want to keep emphasizing so I'll keep saying torque and force are not the same easily confused but they are different in their just their general nature because torque is a force and a lever arm and so that's what makes them different and of course, semantically, they're also different because we would use torque when we're talking about rotations and we would use force when we're talking about translations. So using this idea right here for the equation of, of torque, and so I'll put that over here in my chart. So torque is the lever arm times the force. This will be my insight to what are the units that we use. And so I'll put a little bracket here. But as you know, force is measured in newtons. And a distance, a lever arm, would be measured in meters. And so answering this question here about what units fit in here, I would say that the units then for torque are a Newton meter. Or to put another way, let's say that I did foolishly grab the wrench at the middle of the wrench instead of the end of the wrench. And so this distance here is only a tenth of a meter. Whereas this distance is twice that at two tenths of a meter. And so by holding the wrench right here, I would calculate a torque of 0.1 meters times 100 newtons, which comes out to be 10 newton meters for the torque. Whereas this one here, this torque, would be the lever arm of 0.2 meters and a force of 100 newtons. And so this comes out to be 20 newton meters. And so maybe now when I do the numbers, you begin to see that, hey, it matters where you hold the wrench. You get a different amount of torque because that distance is part of it. So to get, again, more torque, you have to increase one or the other of either the force or the lever arm. And I'll go back to the bike again. That's why the bike makes a good example. If you've ever, you know, had a challenge getting up the hill, one of the things you should do right away is just downshift. You get more torque just because the gear is bigger, not because you have to push harder. Now, on the other hand, you could also get up the hill by just pushing harder because clearly more force gives you more torque. Uh, just like this door. I could come over here and open the door. To open the door, I need a certain amount of torque. If I push the door in this location, it's a small force because it's a pretty big lever arm. But when I push the door at this location, I gotta unlatch it, but when I push the door at this location, I can still open it. <laughs> I, I just need a lot of force corresponding with a small lever arm to get the same amount of torque. So the same amount of torque is needed to open the door. It's just a matter of 
do you want to use a lot of force to get that torque? Or do you want to use a big lever arm to get that torque? Either one will do. Well, like I said, I think because torque is a little bit more challenging than force, I want to spend a little more time here. And so let me show you another experiment. Uh, let me just take a bunch of weights and put it on this rotational platform. Let me uh, lock the platform so it won't move on me quite yet. Let me just hang a little 50 gram brass weight from here. And if you can see here on the uh, video camera, the string comes around and it's wrapped around a pulley under here. So when I let it go, it begins to unwind. And now of course, since it's unwinding, I would say that this string, <coughs> because of the, the pull of the string coming from that brass weight, and the distance or the size of the pulley that the string is wrapped around underneath, that supplies the, the torque. And so I have a certain amount of torque. That torque is then making this object rotate. Uh, let's watch it again. I'll wind it up. And then I'll say it again. I have a certain torque here. So a combination of the force from this weight and then the string is tied to a, a pulley and the pulley has a, has a diameter about that much and I get a torque that makes it unwind. And I might even say it unwinds fairly quickly. But watch this. What if I take this string completely off And I put this string on a different pulley. Down here, near the bottom, there is a smaller pulley. In fact, this apparatus has four of them. 